uh, role is to keep this uh, truck on time. So I'm going to ask uh, the next uh, guest to to join me up on stage, and he is um, he's, he's, uh, he asked me to describe him because I just had a bit of a chat backstage as um, an ape. Oops, I've lost what you asked me. As a, a developer advocate, that was the word I was struggling with, uh, at, at Ru Rubric and an API enthusiast. Well, if you're an API enthusiast, you're certainly at the at the right place here. So without further ado, would you like to introduce yourself, say a few words about yourself whilst you're getting your presentation up on screen, and then I will let you know as soon as everybody else can see it. So please, where are you from? Say a few words about yourself, please. Uh, so my name is Jaap Blasser. I'm uh, based out of Amsterdam, and I'm indeed a developer advocate. And part of my job is to make people enthusiastic about APIs and everything that it uh, that it entails. So can you see my slides right now? You can see your slides. I was just admiring the beautiful uh, spring scenery in, in London. So we can see your second slide. Um, okay. Excellent. So over to you, please. And I will be back in 20 minutes to take some, some questions. Yep, um, absolutely. Enjoy, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Helen. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So on our agenda for today, uh, what we'll first do is I'll get into uh, our API uh, to uh, give a bit of a backstory of where we come from, because uh, I work for Lubric, which is a data management company, which is slightly different from uh, from banking APIs. Then I'll talk about some of the challenges that we're uh, running into when uh, developing APIs, developing our API uh, ecosystem, and also describe a bit about what, uh, what we have going on. And then we'll get into the tooling. Uh, we've developed some internal tooling. We use some external tooling in order to, uh, to ensure that uh, there's no breaking changes going between API versions. And then at the end, when Helen returns, then we'll have time for some Q&A. So feel free to leave any questions in uh, in the chat, and I'll get to that uh, after the session. So first uh, first thing, what do, what do we actually do? So we're a backup and cloud data management company. So what our product uh, does is taking backups, organizing restores, disaster recovery, but also more advanced things such as an, uh, an anomaly detection or spinning up a test and development uh, lab environment. So we're talking today about our REST API, and I want to give a bit of background of how our uh, REST API is structured and um, give a bit of the background of uh, where we are coming from and how we how we solved our issues with uh, com with a product that's continually evolving and with the ecosystem uh, on top of that. So first thing, of course, when we're using our API, we want to authenticate against it. So that's either using uh, username and password or API token. Um, I'm lucky enough to work for a company that's actually uh, built from the ground up to be API first. So. Anything that is uh, that is done to our UI um, is available as an API endpoint, so we can we can use this to build our uh, our SDKs, our plugins, or our automation tools on top of that, and we can actually use the same uh, the same logic. So in that sense, we're very much blessed because everything is already uh, an API. Uh, all we need to figure out is how we can use it to build uh, build cool stuff on top. So our API also consumes third-party APIs. Um, we're uh, built uh, using Spray and SprayCan, and we generate our uh, open API specs as well. And our open API specs are actually what we'll be using to uh, ensure uh, compatibility from version to version. Then uh, one thing that we always found important was uh, to ensure that there's no uh, breaking changes. So the way we version our, uh, our endpoints, uh, we have internal. So internal, uh, it might suggest that it's only for uh, internal uh, company use, but it's actually uh, all the APIs that are not in their final state yet. So uh, an API endpoint can be in internal, uh, internal for, uh, for a couple of months and then released uh, in, the, uh, in a new version of, uh, of our product. And then whenever it ends up in V1, uh, the endpoint can no longer have any uh, any breaking changes to it. 
So that is how we can ensure that whenever new functionality is introduced, what we do is we, we update, we create a new endpoint under V2. So any kind of uh, scripts or automation or SDKs that are built on top of whatever is in version one will always continue to, uh, to work. And then of course we also use GraphQL, but we won't be covering that in this session because we have 20 minutes. So going into that one as well would be, uh, we'll, we'll get a bit short on time. So we have a, a very diverse uh, audience for, uh, uh, for our product. So um, on the left here, we have uh, the people that like the, the, the new and cool functions. I, I, I do like animals, so I like to illustrate it using animals. So the one on the left is someone that just cares about functionality. Then we have in the middle, we have our developers. Our developers are already familiar with, uh, um, with, with API endpoints and how to work with it. So all we need to uh, give them is some documentation and they can write their own code. And then on the right, we uh, we have uh, uh, we have the administrative uh, staff, engineers that just need to work with specific functions of our product. And going into that, we'll see how that maps to our downstream dependencies. So for developers, uh, using the API Explorer or the API Playground is uh, is a great starting point. All our endpoints are listed there. They're also still grouped in the uh, in the internal or uh, v1, v2 settings. And other uh, other tools that are useful for this are uh, Postman or if you're a Chrome user, the Chrome Developer tools are obviously a fantastic tool to see what kind of API queries are being fired off and being able to determine how to uh, uh, how to apply that same logic by just repeating or slightly modifying those API calls. We've recently also uh, launched a uh, um, uh, Rubik uh, Chrome plugin to simplify working with uh, with the API calls in developer tools as well. And then we have a number of abstraction layers. So this is something that would map more to uh, the operators, the engineers that have to work with uh, with our product from day to day. So we have uh, three SDKs, in this case PowerShell, Python, and Golang. And based on their uh, based on the preference, that can be used. Um, on top of that, we've built uh, integrations in a, into a number of automation tools, and then we also have plugins for uh, logging or for self uh, self servers so that is where we're coming from and as you can tell there's a lot of dependencies on our apis so because of that it's also challenging uh, to ensure that everything is going to continue to work whenever a new version of our product is uh, is released and and the first and most obvious way to ensure that all the different uh, all the different SDKs and plugins and uh, uh, automation integrations are still going to be functional. It's by going to the change log. Um, our change logs are public. Uh, the downside of it is that this is a change log of one of our uh, one of our uh, groupings. So this is of internal, and it's already twenty three pages of changes, and that's just going from uh, for a minor version update. So do that times three, that's going to be a lot of reading you need to do. And since we're in the API and automation business, that is not something that, uh, uh, that, that I would like to do. The downside of, uh, of these kind of changes is that it's going to be a change from uh, the current version to the previous version. So if you want to go back two or three or even more versions and want to see what has changed, uh, you just have to mix and match what changed because maybe a change is reverted between two uh, between two versions, so it becomes uh, messy in a sense. So a challenge is reading the change logs because they're very long. There might be a lot of changes when you're going from uh, different product versions. Uh, the changes are not uh, not not listed uh, between those two versions. And then we have our downstream languages built on top and all the integrations. And whenever new functionality is introduced, we also need to know that that uh, functionality uh, is going to be present in 
OR integrations, or at least the integrations where it makes sense. So let's get to let's get to our goal because uh, the goal is of course to to simplify this whole process and not have to manually read and comb through all the change logs in order to determine what kind of changes you have to make because some of um, some of the SDKs we've built uh, have hundreds a uh, hundred thousand lines of code so. Unless you're an expert in that uh, particular SDK, you might not be aware that something needs to change because of a change that is mentioned in the change law. So what we want and what we've created is to be able to uh, report on, uh, on version differences. There were already a lot of tools available for this, uh, but we, we couldn't find a tool that would give us the information uh, that, that we wanted. So. What do you do when you don't get, uh, you cannot find the tools online? Then you just uh, you you write your own uh, you write, write your own tooling on top of that. So what it does is it reports breaking changes, uh, moved endpoints. Because as I mentioned, we have internal, we have v1, we have v2. So whenever an API endpoint graduates uh, from in internal and moves into v1, then uh, we need to be aware of that because we need to update uh, our tooling uh, our downstream dependencies to ensure that we're aware of that. And then also uh, the changes in things like status code, the way the body is structured, or whenever a parameter uh, is either removed, added, or uh, if it's a mandatory parameter that's added, that might be considered a breaking change because if your tooling is not supplying that parameter, it won't work anymore. And also, uh, uh, create reports on specific SDKs. Because as I mentioned, you don't want everyone to be an expert on the entirety of the SDKs that rely on the API uh, endpoints. So let's create uh, simple reports based on that. So what we've created is uh, we built out uh, uh, we built out a comparison uh, a comparison framework. So it takes the Swagger definitions, loads those up. Uh, it uh, looks for uh, specific changes. It looks at the different uh, the different groupings. So internal v1, v2, and then once uh, once it has a list of those changes, it goes into the SDKs. And for those SDKs, we've uh, created a number of tests to. Uh, to determine how the SDK is affected and where changes need to be made. And we even got it to the point where we've uh, integrated it uh, into GitHub so it can automatically uh, launch, uh, create issues up on GitHub so I can then assign them either to myself or to the responsible engineer to ensure that uh, the, the, the tool or whatever is stored in that repository is correctly updated or at least that they're aware that this might be a breaking change. And then secondary to it is also uh, creating reports. So if, for example, uh, uh, someone uh, has an older version of our product and they're going to skip a number of versions, what kind of, uh, what kind of breaking changes uh, should they expect without having to go to the change log? So our lessons learned. Um, Going to the change logs is not uh, is not a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of pages. There's a lot of changes. Many things also don't uh, don't affect uh, don't affect our downstream uh, downstream dependencies. But actually, creating the automation for it is a lot of fun because trying to figure out how to uh, how to um, convert changes in our API to changes that need to be uh, made in specific SDKs and then automatically creating, uh, creating GitHub issues for that. That was actually a lot of fun to, uh, to figure out and to ensure that that uh, works as intended. The downside is that there's also uh, a number of edge cases where it's kind of hard to automate unless you're uh, unless you're aware that those edge cases exist and the only way unfortunately to figure out that they exist was by going to uh, by going to the change logs and uh, example of this one is where uh, there was a very specific renaming of a couple of endpoints uh, they they were in 
they moved from internal to v1 but there was just a slight uh, slight change in how it was named so we had to add some additional logic in there to ensure that that uh, that was properly caught and then whenever new functionality comes which could either be a completely new endpoint or an endpoint that was already in v1 that now also exists in v2 uh, we need to be aware of that and those are things that we can then uh, raise github issues for or uh, create reports for so whoever uh, is responsible for uh, keeping that uh, uh, that piece of software up to date uh, can be made aware of that and then also to integrate it into uh, the processes so part of that uh, creating the issues making sure that all the re relevant information is in uh, in there but also creating uh, CI/CD pipelines, which uh, which can run against different versions, different SDKs, and automatically generate all the reports without actually having to do anything uh, ourselves. Which for me is always the for me is always the ideal goal to ensure that uh, there's a minimal uh, minimal amount of manual steps that we have to take. And with that one. I would uh, like to open it up for questions. Um, if you have no questions now, or I don't get to your question, I think Twitter is the easiest way to reach me. Uh, let me know if uh, there's any questions. Helen, are you still here? I am still here. It just seems to take me a little bit of a lag to get back on. Sorry, I wasn't abandoning you. No problem at all. I love your llamas. Absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you. It's blowing a gale outside, so that's uh, cheered me up and brightened up the afternoon. We don't have any questions, um, um, but I think if you, as everybody um, is being a little bit shy, so I would suggest, that, as you said, the best way to uh, connect you, uh, connect with you rather, is on LinkedIn or Twitter. Yeah, yeah. both and, uh, both will work. There's not a lot of yap gushers out there, so. No. No, um, but what we will do is we'll be sharing uh, th this content online, and we do know that it gets a lot of viewing um, over the weekend and, and the following weeks to come. It's brilliant content. Thank you very, very, very much. And thank you for joining us at API Days. No problem at all. Now, um, our next guest um, will be uh, joining us um, any moment. Um, we are just sort of changing jockeys mid-race. So the next guest will be joining us on stage um, in um, after the break. So we're going to take a little bit of a break there. That caught me on the hoop, didn't it? We're going to take a little bit of a break, and um, we will see you back very shortly. Thank you.